Let's uh, come before our great God now, and we might be distracted a little bit from those smells out there. It smells delicious, but we'll pray that we can stay focused until, until then. Let's, let's come before God. Our great God and Father, I just want to thank you for, um, yeah, for this time that we've had, for the words that we have sung together, uh, for the testimony that we have heard of your goodness in Quinton's life. We thank you that we have your word now, Lord, and we, we pray that you would uh, indeed be our teacher. Please give us a clear mind. Please give us our soft hearts. Please help us to be willing and ready to learn from you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've ever perhaps been at school, maybe work, uh, maybe a shopping centre or something like that, and you've looked down to notice that you weren't wearing any clothes. Uh, somehow you're there, uh, but there you are, naked. Uh, but thankfully you wake up. You wake up, don't you? Uh, I've had a couple of those dreams. Um, I was speaking to someone recently, um, a few weeks ago, that had mentioned they'd had these type of dreams. And you hear sitcoms kind of work with this thing, and, and, and uh, you hear people say, say the same thing, that they've experienced this. Uh, and it is strange, isn't it? Because in this kind of dream state, you have those feelings, and they're quite strong, those feelings of embarrassment, uh, of uh, wondering how on earth you got there with no clothes on, and you're kind of hastily looking around for something to cover you. Uh, some have noted that dreaming uh, of being naked before a group of peers uh, it kind of uh, has this sign that might be speaking uh, that you uh, have some sort of insecurity or maybe shame or, or just feeling vulnerable. And others uh, speak about uh, if you have these dreams and you don't have those feelings of, of embarrassment, then maybe it's speaking of the fact that you're desiring freedom, you know, of being released of something holding you back. Uh, you know, these dreams likely do mean something. It's maybe a bit subjective in how you interpret it. Um, not sure if you have any of those dreams too, Paul. Perhaps not preaching. I hope not. I've never had anything like that. Uh, I've only had those preaching dreams where you come and you're, you're not prepared. You're put on the spot, kind of like the dream I'm having now. <laughs> Just kidding. We're all good. But I start with this, uh, you know, kind of this idea of, of you know, dreams like this. Because the passage we're zooming on today picks up on the theme of our desire to be clothed rather than being naked, as it speaks about death, as it speaks about hope and life, but also in how thinking about death and hope and life will motivate us in how we live now for Jesus. So this morning uh, we are in, uh, going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you've got your Bibles there, uh, open them up and uh, follow along, we're going to read through the whole thing as we go uh, through this chapter. So 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if you look at 2 Corinthians, it's, it's quite amazing, an amazing um, letter. It's one where Paul really wears his heart uh, and his emotions on his sleeve as he's almost kind of begging these guys to, to be reconciled to, to him, to be uh, you know, reconciled and united with one another in their obedience to Christ. And if we're to look at a little bit at the context of what we're going to be doing as we launch into chapter 5, what we see is that Paul's trying to show this church that what matters to God is the inward person, not, not on how things appear on the outside. Uh, the Corinthians, if you read 1 Corinthians even and 2 Corinthians, they seem to be a church that really uh, the outward and... and um, what goes on and what you can see mattered to them. It's where they really highly respected those who were quite elegant in how they preached and, and spoke. And they looked up and they tried to compete with who was more spiritual or so-called spiritual. They, they held that in high regards, what you could see. Uh, but when you looked at Paul's life, he was one that was kind of constantly ridiculed. He's whipped a few times, he's beaten, he's thrown... Uh, you know, before the courts, often, even in Corinth, where he's writing to. He, he's put into all sorts of mess for the sake of the gospel. And so when we, when we get to chapter 4, he comes to this place where he's speaking about the fact that he's really just a, 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 jay, a jar of clay. He's weak-looking. He's a weak-looking vessel, but he is a proclaimer of the greatest treasure ever as God's servant, as, as his apostle. And so he points out to them at the end of chapter 4, 
that he does not lose heart. He, he can be ridiculed, persecuted, beaten, nonstop. But he will not stop. Now let me read just this end of chapter 4 as we head into our passage today. He says there, whoops, chapter 4, verse 16, So we do not lose heart, though the outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. So why does Paul not lose heart? Well, it's because despite all outward appearances, despite looking weak, and like he's losing all the time, despite all this, we're going to see in chapter 5 that he has a great confidence in something that is just richer and realer and greater than ever. Uh, so can I say, if, like, if you were in a place this morning where, you know, just in life, maybe you're feeling weighed down or tempted to lose heart, like, come along and, and let's see what God teaches us here so that we would not lose heart, so that we would keep going in great perseverance and joy. So what we see first, as we dive into chapter 5, is we see where Paul's hope and confidence lay. And it's in this, it's in the reality of death, but also in the reality of the hope of the richer and realer. Let me read verses 1 to 4. So leading on, we don't don't lose heart. For we know... That if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. It's great uh, illustrations that Paul uses, that of the idea of you know, tents and buildings, that of dwelling and that of clothing. He first picks up that theme of tent, doesn't he? That if this tent we live in is destroyed, he says we have a building from God. And what does it mean here? Well, Paul speaking and talking pretty much about what we've been looking at over the last few weeks in our series. That although this body will die, we have a certain hope of a new transformed body that is far realer and better. That's what basically Paul's saying, isn't he? He's saying that this body now is like a a mere tent. And we know tents are temporary things. They're certainly not as sturdy or as lasting. I love camping, um, especially when it's in a building with a bed, uh, a five-star preferably. Because the last time I went camping, it was many years ago, I got to the campsite late, I set up the tent, all excited. Uh, It was dark though when we got there, so we set it up in the the night, probably don't do that. Uh, Because in the middle of the night, it was super stormy and I woke up freezing, absolutely cold, drenched because I was laying in like a thick puddle just, just sitting there and... The reason why is we'd kind of set the tent up in the ditch. Don't do that either. But the tent was old as well, so it just had lots of holes in it and all the water. It, like you could actually see it still rising. It was bubbling still. It was just pouring in. Tents don't last. They're fragile. And, and that's kind of Paul's point, that this time and body we live in, it's temporary. And the reality is, is that they do break down, don't they? They degrade. And we will as all well, as well face death but here's the hope of the christian that what god has already in store for you is not not another tent but something solid and rich it's real we have it now it's something not temporary is it it's eternal but did you notice in the passage uh, that paul picks up two things that go on though while we are in this tent this body not sure if you've realized yet, but living for Jesus in this world is hard. 
It involves being rejected at times by many in this world. And it also involves us rejecting the things and desires that it tries to throw at us. You know, don't get me wrong, living for Jesus is so good. There's no other way to do it. But it's also hard. And just living in this life through pain and trials... There's many blessings in life, but there's many you know, kind of difficulties and hard things that go on as well, isn't there? And Paul says, you know, the weight and burden of getting by, of, of serving Jesus and living for him as we're surrounded uh, by sin and the effects both within us and that from outside of us, it makes us groan. But on the positive side, of it, it makes us long, doesn't it? It makes us long for that which is better. No pain, where there's no turmoil, no stain of sin. So he says, in our hearts we groan in this body, but we long for the solid and eternal body that God promises. But did you also notice how Paul then kind of moves, doesn't he? He switches it up from this idea of tent and body to clothing there as well. And this is something important for us to notice because it's not that Paul desires death. It's not that he wants to be bodiless. He says being naked is not good. Being bodiless is not what we are longing for. We don't long to die. We don't long to to lose our body and be naked. But we're longing, aren't we, to be further clothed with resurrection life. That I love how he puts it, that swallows up. It's like a bigger fish, better fish that comes along and the old is gone. But then the question comes for us then, if, if that's not the ideal to be naked and that's nowhere near as good as being clothed, then, then what, what about the time in between? Like what about that intermediate st- state and time before we are buildings, before we have raised transformed bodies? What about that? Well, that is where Paul comes to his second driving motive for his confidence and his assurance it's, it's that, although it's not ideal to be bodiless, it's still better by far to be with Christ. That's what he says there. To, to have reunion with Christ is far better. Let me read verses 5 to 8. It says, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us his spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. It's pretty clear, isn't it? That although being bodiless, it's it's not our end goal. It's not what we're longing for. But it's still better by far than being in this temporary body. Why? Well, because it means we will be much closer with Christ. We'll be with him. I don't know if you've ever had those times where you just, it's maybe been a hard time and you're alone and you're just crying out to God and you're like, God, I don't understand what I'm going through. Why? But I trust you, God. You're just on your knees. But then you have that still small voice that says, Lord, but I just want to see you. Like, Could could you reveal it? Like, Could I just see you now? I want to be closer to you. And yet we're left, aren't we, to say, I trust you still. To be home in our present body means that we can only live by faith, not seeing him as he fully is. But at that time we put off this temporary tent will actually mean that we are with Christ. No longer by faith, can you see? But we see him face to face. We'll be with him. That's why Paul says he's he's of great courage no matter what, no matter what's going on in life. He has assurance. It's like he's saying, doesn't matter, we got this, we got this. Or or more so he's saying, God has got this. You notice what God has done there in verse 5? What he has already given us? It says there, doesn't he? He's prepared us for for this very thing because he has given us his spirit as a guarantee. That's how much sure we have. It's like God's already put that large deposit down. You know, he's, he's already given it. Uh, we, 
when we put a deposit down on a house or something like that, there's a risk, isn't there, that we could lose a deposit, we could lose the house, lose everything. But that's not what it's like with God. What he does, what he works towards, what he promises, it, it always comes to pass. And we see that in Jesus. And in Christ and in him giving us his spirit, do you know it's actually more like he's put down the 100% deposit? He's put it all down. We don't have it yet. It's a deposit. But we have his spirit with us completely. But it still means, though, that we wait, don't we? We wait now in faith. We don't yet have what? We can't see it. We don't yet have it. But in death, it will no longer be by faith. We'll see him as he is. So we have confidence, don't we? We have assurance in God in this life because of our hope of being with Christ. Because of our hope of being fully clothed at his return in the far better and realer and richer. And so then Paul moves and shifts gear a little bit because he talks about then what having this confidence does for us, what it means, what it, what it should do and, and how it should shape our lives. What does it do? Well, it gives us resolve to look to who Jesus is as our king and judge. It gives us great resolve. Let me read verses 9 and 10. So he said he'd rather be home. It's better to be with the Lord so whether we're home, we're at home uh, or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. What does, Paul hope, what does Paul's hope do? It brings about a resolve in our life, doesn't it? An aim, a purpose. Uh, to, to, to live for Jesus, to please him. You know, I'm sure if we were, were asked, that's what we would say. That's what my goal is to be in life. But if we're honest, like, is that always our resolve? But our answer would be, we want to be, yeah. I, I want that to be my passion. I, I want it to be my resolve to please my Lord and my King. Well, if, that, if, that, if that is you, then listen to what Paul says as he gives this added kind of basis to this goal it's, it's actually very sobering it's a reminder of who jesus is he's king and lord and judge verse 10 says there doesn't he for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ all of us uh, that those two words judgment seat is actually one uh, word in the greek uh bema uh, it's a word, this word bema, that was well known to the church in Corinth. It literally means uh, a raised step or platform. Uh, and in ancient times, the bema was, was the place that was known in the city where the governor or an official would go uh, to kind of uh, sit over and hear court cases. Uh, so Jesus himself, if you read uh, in, the, in the Gospels, he was brought bef before the bema seat of Pilate. And in Acts, we read Paul in Corinth itself, probably about four years or so earlier, he was dragged before Galileo, uh, before the beamer, before his beamer. And actually, this, uh, this is a picture of it today. Uh, Pastor Paul said he's been there, uh, so that's the beamer. That little plaque, a little silver thing, you probably can't see it, actually has that title on there. You can go visit the one in Corinth today. It's amazing, isn't it? But here's something for us to know, something that is the basis for, for the way that we live life, is that one day we will all stand before the beamer of Christ, for his judgment seat. It's, it's pretty sobering though, isn't it? That one day you and I will come before his judgment seat, where everything you have done, those things that were secret, both good and wrong, will be brought to light. sobering but I just want to be clear here because it might bring to our minds uh, especially when we see those words so that each one of us may receive what is due for what he's done in the body whether good or evil w what this isn't saying here is that our works bring about our justification so on that day we'll stand before Jesus and he'll be like oh the good outweighs the bad that's not what we're going we know this don't we we know this that it is only by the grace of God through faith in Jesus, that we are already justified. 
And Paul, Paul's already said this in that he knows he has confidence in God already preparing a body. He knows he is right in God's sight. We know those verses well, don't we? Those memory verses, Romans 3, 6, uh, Romans 3, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. It's all of it, isn't it? We all have sinned, all are condemned, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Romans 8, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free already from the law of sin and death in Christ Jesus. He has already won us, hasn't he? So what's, what's going on here then? If we know we're saved by faith alone, well, the other thing we know from the scriptures as well is that faith isn't empty, is it? That's what trust looks like. You know, we, we are saved by faith alone and not at all by the things we do. But we are saved for good things, though, aren't we? We are saved for those good things God has prepared for us. So what's Paul getting at here? Well, he's speaking, isn't he? And he's focusing and talking about pleasing the Lord Jesus. That's what he is centering on. He has been saved by his Lord and King and he wants to please him. He wants to know that all that he does, all of his efforts before the King are weighed up before him. So this is his focus. He's reminding the church here that one day they'll have to give an account before Jesus. Actually, all will have to give an account before Jesus. We know that too, don't we? That those who reject him they will, they will stand before him condemned because they didn't accept the message of salvation. And even those also who kind of claimed and paid lip service to Jesus, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. Yet yeah, what will Jesus say to them on that day? There's those words, I don't know you. Who, who are you away from me. But for Christians, those who have been saved, who are no longer condemned, Coming before the judgment seat of Christ is not about condemnation, but it's about evaluation. Can you see that? It's a ju judgment for the Christians who are already justified. It kind of lands on how, how did they live out their faith? Did they serve their king? And so what seems to be happening is kind of what Jesus has been talking about when he speaks about parables of greater your rewards. Well done, good and faithful servant. Um, as I was preparing for this, I was kind of trying to think of an example, and the only thing that came to mind was if, you, if I could picture uh, you know, a good king, and there was two servants, uh, two workers, employees of this king, uh, and this king was a good king. He, he loved justice, he was gracious to his people, he was good, he, was very, he gave gifts all the time. Uh, and so you can imagine one king... Uh, Sorry, one king. You can imagine one of the, the employees that served this king, he loved the, the fact that his king was just and good and, and he just worked with all his might and he served him and he maybe started work earlier and everything he did, he did with his whole heart. But then perhaps the other king was a little bit flippant in how he worked. Maybe he was late lots, uh, didn't rock up at all. And maybe he was a bit half-hearted in how he served his king. Could you see how it would be a good thing that if the king had a day where he knew everything that was going on, how it would be good is if both of those servants came to him and he acknowledged and said, well done. Like, and he rewarded them for how they worked, how they lived, because of, of how they, they honoured their king. But what that, will that day be like for us, like if we come before Jesus? Like, will it be one that Jesus acknowledges our lives as having a faith that trusted in him and worked? Is it going to be a picture of like a, a beautiful apple tree where there's, there's just fruit abounding, there's life that is displayed? Is that what it will be like? Or will we be, on the other hand, maybe smelling a little bit smoky? There seems to be uh, this idea of rewards and loss of rewards um, you know, if you look at 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul's speaking about the leaders there, he, he says these words. 
Each one's work will become manifest. It will be made known. Become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on, the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Uh, I remember at high school, um, there was a a couple of uh, guys who went into the boys' toilets and set off one of those orange emergency flares uh, from boats that you use on boats. Uh, And apparently when they did, there was so much smoke just absolutely pouring off it that they they dropped it and and rushed out of there. Uh, But then one of the the guys was actually a bit worried, um, not that the the toilet would be caught on fire, but that if it did, it's going to be certainly found out what had happened. So he was worried that the toilet block would, would catch on fire. So he went to go back in, and as he opened the door... Uh, the, the black smoke was that thick that it looked like there was a wall. Uh, but they rushed in, quickly and carefully uh, flushed uh, this uh, flare and put it out and then took off out of there and walked out of the toilets. Uh, but the thing is, as the, both the guys then walked across the quadrant uh, from one building block to the next, they kind of noticed that everyone was staring at them. And it was a bit strange and weird and it was clear that everyone was like, you know, double, double looking and glancing. And then one of the guys who didn't go in the toilet looked over and noticed and he said, oh, dude, oh, my goodness, you are absolutely covered in black stuff. And just as he said that, they looked up and there's a teacher also coming uh, towards them, so they quickly hurried off. Uh, I know this guy felt pretty embarrassed and feeling really dumb because it was me who lit the flare and (laughs) went back in and was covered. But here's the thing is that we thought maybe we could get away with it, but there was no hiding it at all. There was that day... That day, I did go into the principal's office. I knew what had happened. But on that day, there will be no hiding what our faith looked like. On that day, how we live for Jesus, he he already knows. It will be evaluated. It will be weighed up. And what Paul says here is he wants to be revealed as one who lived a life, who loved his king and pleased him. The king that gave him life. And that's really amazing, isn't it, to think about that God has loved you. He's, he's given you his own son. That the Lord Jesus died your death. It's paid for. You are made right before the living God because of Jesus. Justified, made right. And then he gives you his spirit that works in you, changing you, changing your heart, softening it. And he does, the spirit also works to enable you to do those good things that God has prepared you to do. He does all this, and then on that day, we will be the ones who will be rewarded. That's crazy good, isn't it? Rewarded for simply serving the Lord Jesus, our King, the one who saved us. So church, if you've given your heart, if you've given your allegiance to Jesus as your Lord and as your Saviour, you know that God has loved you. He has given you his spirit as a guarantee that one day you will be with him fully clothed. So you have assurance and courage because he has got you. He's got you. So that no matter the trials, the, the hardships, the struggles in this life, your hope in death means that you will be with Christ. You have hope of new resurrection bodies. Eternal, not temporary anymore. So therefore, in everything, in what you do with your eyes, in what you do and say with your tongues, in what you think with your minds, in what you do with your hands, in in, in all situations, work, rest and play, make it your aim and purpose to please him, to please the Lord Jesus, so that on that day you won't be wearing those white robes, smelling a little bit smoky, But instead, we'll hear those amazing words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Great are your rewards in heaven. Let's pray. Our good and gracious God. Our God, who is the God of all comfort and the God of all hope, we thank you for your great mercy and kindness to us in Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for 
the king who gave his life for us, who brought us from death to life, and who through we have the promise of life. Um, God, you know our hearts, you know our lives, you know our failures to, to love you with our whole being. And yet you call us to live for you and to serve you. So Lord, I just want to pray that you would work in us as a church to be a people who remind one another of this great and certain hope we have. So that we would be people who live to please Jesus. Father, I just want to pray as well for those who still might feel a bit burdened by life, those who are suffering loss. May you give them insight and awareness of your grace, but also a great awareness of the hope that they have. And this, this will comfort them and lift them up so that they might run the race to serve their King. We pray for them, Lord, and we pray for us. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.